I wasn't kidding about what an honor I think it is to address the Jung Society. At one point in my life, my greatest desire was to become a Jungian analyst. And I had the good fortune of coming upon Jung very young. I was about 15 when a very precocious friend of mine brought uh, Psychology and Alchemy in the Kerry F. Baines translation. I think it had just been brought out. And we were stunned, and we read it from cover to cover, and then went on to Mysterium Cunjunctiones, Ion, the studies in the phenomenology of the self. I said to someone yesterday, we read all the books of Jung that the Jungians never read. Uh, they seem to stop up there toward the front of the line with the archetypes of the collective unconscious and the personality type. But to my mind, it was the late stuff that was fascinating. And I am slightly puzzled, and we were talking about it last night, at the distance between the Jungian community and the psychedelic community because they seem to me, the unschooled observer, to be uh, definitely sharing the same concerns and strangely enough they share much of the same history and geography. Basel was of course Jung's hometown, it was Albert Hoffman's hometown. Did one half of town know what the other half was doing? <laughs> I, I'm not sure. Um, the, the relationship of Jung to the unconscious, uh, to the collective unconscious as its discoverer has been always somewhat puzzling to me because of course if you know the history of 20th century art, you know that Dada which was the great prefigurative movement for surrealism, rose in Zurich. So, you know, we've got LSD, the uh, schools of modern art that laid great stress on the irrational, and the great schools of psychology that extended the boundaries of the unconscious, all rattling around in these little Swiss towns. And... Uh, uh, it's interesting to imagine conversations or meetings that might have taken place uh, when people slightly left their ordinary habits and wandered into bars they didn't know and <laughs> drank with people they'd never met before. Uh, because Jung provided maps of the unconscious, and at 16, when we were beginning to experiment with this, and and let me stress, this was before the great social waves of LSD taking of the 1960, just preceding that, from about 1963 uh, to 65, we were frantic for maps of the unconscious, and Freud was useless. I mean, the notion that the contents of the psychedelic experience could be reduced to what Freud called day residues and repressed sexual design stuff like didn't wash. Within 10 minutes, you could tell that was not a serviceable metaphor. <laughs> Jung, on the other hand, offered a vast uh, pantheon of uh, gods and archetypes and psychic complexes forgotten or abandoned. I mean, I thought of Jung basically as a no what I call a noetic archaeologist someone who goes with toothbrush and nut pick to dig away the detritus from the bones of vanished idea systems. And if any of you have ever read the complete, the works of Jung in the, in the Bollinger set, you know that the richness of it is all in the footnotes. I mean, here was a man who raised the footnote to a high art <laughs> and who was aware of a literature that nobody else to my mind, seem to know about, that Jung's references reach a thousand years deep into the past with great uh, uh, density of reference. I mean, this is where I learned about Macrobius and Docetheus and Dionysius, the pseudo Areopagite, and all those folks that you just never hear about. It was uh, my introduction to the, under, to the underbelly of Western uh, civilization uh, was through Jung. 
Well, uh, to my mind, and now I'll theme this in to today's theme, uh, I think Maria mentioned that uh, Jung did not say, have a lot to say about shamanism. He came to it late in his life and he had already worked through the massive, the exegesis of the symbol systems of the European mind. And so he was sort of content to indicate shamanism as an area where more work was to be done. And then the great follow-on scholar was Mersiliad, who then actually uh, studied shamanism, showed what its archetypal underpinnings were, in all times and places. And uh, the combination of Jung and Iliad, I think, pretty much delivered us as firm a map of the psyche, as dependable a map of the psychic geography as we can expect to have until we make the trip ourselves and uh, you know, readjust the landscape with our own notes and uh, observations. For, for Jung, the great path into the unconscious uh, was alchemy. And alchemy uh, is an interesting, pivotal uh, domain because I think we could, in a way, say it lies halfway between the concerns of an archaic shamanism and halfway between the concerns of a uh, quasi-scientific uh, psychedelic attempt to explore consciousness. Uh, Mersiliad wrote a brilliant book on alchemy called The Forge and the Crucible, which is the bridge to show you how you go from Jungian psychology into an understanding of alchemy that approximates Iliad. The notion for the alchemists that Jung brought forth very strongly was the idea of projection of psychic contents, projection of the active imagination onto processes and uh, objects in the exterior world. In the case of the alchemists, it was the swirling chemical processes in their alembics, in their alchemical vessels, that they projected uh, the... Uh, the great round of the archetypes on to these chemical processes. They saw crystallization, sublimation, separation as statements about the contents of the psyche as much as statements about uh, the exterior world because for them the firm division between mind and matter the firm ontological division between mind and matter that is built into Western thinking now did not exist. That comes with René Descartes, with the invention of what's called the res extensa, the extended world, and the res virens, the interior world, which has no spatial extension. Uh, so for the alchemists, mind and matter were, th were two terms whose mutual exclusivity could be blurred under certain circumstances, and the terms of one could migrate toward the other. Well, now we as moderns ordinarily only experience this state when we are intoxicated by hallucinogenic drugs or when we are in a state of severe uh, psychic uh, weakness, when there is then overwhelmment from the unconscious that is not, uh, not with the permission of the ego as happens in the psychedelic experience. Well, all of these various ways of approaching the psyche uh, seem fairly abstract and bloodless and removed from daily existence unless the psychedelic experience is uh, present. And then it vivifies these metaphors. It makes clear what these various perennial traditions are uh, talking about. I encountered DMT, LSD, all of these things in that very period when I was getting set to uh, take flight as a Jungian analyst. And what 
completely blew my mind about DMT, and uh, I mention it in a, again, here's an opportunity for research, is how trans, here's a heretical construction, how trans-archetypal the content of the flash seemed. I was appalled, because not only had I a certain amount of interest in Jung and proclivity along those lines, but my original major had been art history. Art historians, what we're trained to do is to be able to look at a motif and say, oh yes, I'm familiar from, with this from ceramic from second millennia Peru and also Mandayan uh, uh, embroidery work. We know motifs. We're trained to recognize and connect disparate aesthetic domains. Well, when I smoked DMT and came down, I said, you know, this is not on the map. I can't believe it. That This doesn't connect up to anything. How can there be domains of the human mind that do not announce themselves in folklore, fairy tales, dreams, or mandala painting that are so removed from the ven of what is human that they are apparently not accessible in structuring our uh, maps of our self and our psyche. And that for me was the contact with what I call, and I didn't call it this, Rudolf Otto called it this, and this term influenced Jung, Otto preceded Jung, was it is the holy other. And if there is an archetype of the holy other, then this is it. But perhaps the holy other transcends the archetypes. This may explain to some degree Jung's interest in Gnosticism, especially the Valentinian school of Gnosticism, which holds, you know, that there is a higher and hidden Father, all God, who is outside the machinery of cosmic fate. And it seemed to me that in those extremely profound DMT flashes, I was actually witnessing a domain outside the machinery of the archetypes, which is, for us as moderns, that's what the machinery of fate is. It's not zodiacal machinery. It's hardwiring in our psychology and our genes that gives us our fate. The most startling thing about the DMT flash, and I mentioned this this morning when we were talking about Jung, is how astonishing it is that death by astonishment seems the major danger. And this is even if you're an art historian, a Jungian, an aficionado of symbols and so forth and so on. It seems to come from some dimension orthogonal to uh, the human world. And it is not a unitary experience, the way the famous white light and all these other wordless, indescribable, elusive, mercurial things are. It isn't like that at all. It's, uh, it's extremely multiplistic and it's extremely specific in its, in, in its presentation. And when you smoke DMT, you have the f feeling that you have burst into a place that you have not had a psychological experience, you are not having a mental experience, you have burst into some kind of a space. And within that space, um, there are, the first shock is that it's inhabited. And this is the shock I've never recovered from, because it was just the last thing I expected to find inside a chemical compound was the equivalent of a Bugs Bunny cartoon. Uh, it is inhabited by um, entities, is the only word to describe them. And they are, as I've said many times, they are like jeweled, self-dribbling basketballs. And there are many of them. And they come out of the background and they present themselves to you. They're literally vibrating up and down with excitement. They're faceted and rotating. And they see you as clearly as you see them. They even uh, greet you. 
Some of you may recall the Pink Floyd, the old Pink Floyd song, The Gnomes Have Learned a New Way to Say Hooray. <laughs> I think it's on Piper at the Gates of Dawn. It's the first album those Floyd fans were looking puzzled. It's because it was 40 years ago or something. <laughs> Anyway, as you burst into this space, the gnomes say hooray, and they present themselves, and they are the true. They are truly the gnomes of uh, of Central European fairy tales, archetypal gnomes. They are. Uh, they sing, and out of their singing, elfin chatter condense objects which look like nothing at all in this world. I mean, the closest I've been able to come to them are the, Fabrig the eggs of Fabergé, you know, these constructs in sapphire and ivory and crystal and vitreous glass that uh, the French designer Fabergé created. Well, these things are like that, but they're like that raised to some excruciating pinnacle of completion because as they show you these objects you know beyond any possibility of contravention that if a single one of these objects were to exist in this world it would change this world forever if a single one of these objects were to exist in this world we would spend a thousand years studying this object the last time this happened was a guy gave a speech up on a hill about moral obligation. We studied it for a thousand years. Uh, this is the same kind of thing. And these Fabergé hyperdimensional objects are themselves undergoing a dynamic transformation. They're not static objects like the Fabergé eggs. They are undergoing changes, singing, condensing other objects. These objects are crawling all over the ground in front of you, clamoring for your attention. Now remember, 12 seconds before you were sitting in a suburban living room somewhere grappling with some drug somebody wanted you to take. Now all that's gone. And here are these things. I call them tykes because I wanted to capture the sense of their childlikeness. I don't know why I called them tykes, actually. It just seemed like the appropriate thing. If some of you are classicists or students of the literature of the pre-Socratic philosophers, you might recall the 52nd fragment of Heraclitus, which says, uh, the aeon is a child at play with colored balls. The aeon is a child at play with colored balls. And when you break your way into the presence of the aeon, it's extremely, it can, um, I don't know, it's upsetting. You can't believe it's happening. There's a lot of cognitive dissonance. You could believe this if it just weren't happening to you. <laughs> and there is this tremendous effect and interest in humanity, and then there is urgency, a lot of urgency. The tykes want to initiate you. They have a message, and the message is you can do what we are doing, and what they're doing is using their voices to make physical objects condense out of the air, and they're saying you can do this. Do it, do it, do it, and they're on you, and they, they jump in and out of your chest, which is something that is described in the Amazon, too, the Hikuli in the tryptamine snuff cults of the Yanomama. Uh, they, they jump in and out of your chest, and they are saying, do this thing, do it, do it, suspend your belief, and eventually you do do it. You, you discover that you can drop the filter of meaning, that your voice can move back several registers, and out comes elf chatter. And this elf chatter is able to wring the air in front of you like a washcloth, 
and get alchemical gold to drip out of the air and to begin to condense in front of you. Well, at this, by this time, most people would like to call time out <laughs> so they can make phone calls to various philosophers. <laughs> but there is no time out. It, it just keeps going. Uh, and these things have a, a very, the aura of strangeness of alienness is palpable. There's an emotion in there that we just don't have in this world because it's composed of unbelievable alienness in the presence of unbe unbelievable familiarity. It's, a, it's a, an ecstasy that is a coincidencia appositorum. Simultaneously, it is both what it is and what it is not. And the human mind can't handle that. That's called cognitive dissonance. I mean, you just go into a, a conniption fit of some sort. Well, the very first time I smoked DMT in 1967, with absolutely no expectation, this happened to me. And it has happened every time since. And then I've had occasion to observe people taking DMT. Uh, in countries where it's legal. And what I see is there is an archetype which surrounds DMT, which you must make your way through it. But at the center of the archetype, the archetype is not present and only the alien is present. The archetype is that of the circus or the carnival. The carnival. Think for a moment about the carnival. It has two aspects. One is blazing light and activity at the center of the triple ring. The lady in the spangled costume is high above the main floor and the lions and the tigers and the clowns are parading around. That's part of it. But it has another aspect. Just off to the side of the big tent, there are the sideshows the hoochie-coochie dancers, the two-headed man, and so forth and so on. In other words, there's this kinky, peculiar, shadow side of it. And I often, uh, if any of you are fans of the film of Federico Fellini, here's a man who understood the archetype of the circus and how, in, if you remember in Amarcord, that circus, or if you remember in Giulietta di Spiri, the, the flaming doorway into the room with the bed, with the bed springs and the crate paper flames. These are carnival, carnival images that relate back uh, to DMT. When you finally come into the center of it, these are all seen to be veils. It, it veils itself that way because that's how you... Uh, it's the old candy to the baby routine treats us as people who would like to go to the circus. And then it takes us to the circus. But then there is a revelation beyond that. And I, I don't know how many people present in this room have confronted the thing I'm talking about. I always, at this moment, am aware that some people are saying, my, doesn't he perfectly get it? And other people are saying, huh? What is this? What is this guy talking about? The point I want to make is it's real. It's not vague. You don't have to strain for it. Nobody wonders whether or not it happened to them. It's just like somebody walking up to you and taking you by the arm and saying, there's something I insist on showing you. Come this way, please. And I am very... It was the presence of the entities that shattered the person who I was because I was a scientific rationalist, a reductionist. I had no, no room for elves in my cosmology. <laughs> and here they were, hundreds of them. So it, it seems to me that this is a central question that shamanism has always dealt with, perhaps not with the kind of ontological sophistication that we imagine ourselves to have, but this is the question that must be asked. Who's in there? Who is this? There are at least three possibilities. 
and I'm not sure which is the most conservative. The first possibility is that um, we don't understand how the world is constructed, and that, in fact, there is a parallel universe running alongside of ours, uh, full of elves who use a language to make objects. And then why you can burst through to this place on this one drug, you know, then that raises, each explanation raises a lot of questions. Uh, then the other possibility is, uh, um, this is the Jungian possibility. And Jung, in, uh, I can't remember which one it was, but one of the later things, he talks about these elves because of the Kibiri, the Kibiri, are the alchemical children that appear in Act 3 of Faust that Jung spent a lot of time on these alchemical kibiri and the question of the homunculus. And uh, he says at one place, I think he says, uh, uh, he describes them as autonomous psychic elements that have escaped from the control of the ego. This is a weird way to go about it. I mean, it's probably an accurate description, but how much does it tell us, you know? It means that the psyche is to be visualized as a half gallon of mercury, and when we throw it on the floor, the mercury balls up and spreads everywhere, and each ball of mercury you look at, by, by gad, it has a little face looking back at you. That's because Mercury is a mirrored surface. You're looking at your own psyche shattered into thousands of, of pieces around you. Another possibility, and one I leaned toward for years, and I still lean toward, because I've noticed the radical nature of your explanation uh, diminishes with the distance since the last time you smoked a DMT. Uh, the longer it's been, the more likely you are to have some humdrum notion that you can pour it into. So the humdrum notion that I settled on was, well, clearly these are just extraterrestrials. <laughs> this is, they don't come in silver ships demanding to be taken to the National Defense Agency. This is how they come. Why they come this way? Who knows? They're coming through mind. Mind is the medium in which they travel. Where do they come from? Who knows? Can it even be located in the Newtonian space-time matrix? I mean, what do you want here? A star catalog number? Would that satisfy you? Uh, and then finally, and I think I've exceeded my number of possible explanations, um, <laughs> And then finally, the explanation, which is my current favorite, it dis it's a little disturbing, um, and I haven't quite figured out what to do with it, but I have a sense we're on the right track here. The reason the DMT space feels so peculiar, both alien and excruciatingly uh, uh, familiar, is uh, because these things in this other place represent what I call an ecology of souls. This place is the one place you never thought you were going to make a visit to and come back to chat it around the coffee maker. This, they're dead. That's who these things are. This is the realm of the dead. Well, I have to confess, in all of my psychedelic voyaging and idea-mongering and all of that, I never was able to go that far, to reach that far in my imagination. It sort of had to be presented to me. But if you go to shamans worldwide and talk to them about their spirit helpers and say, you know, what's the deal with this? You know, who are these things? And they say, well, these are the ancestors. Didn't you know? These are the ancestors. It's perfectly cut and dried and normal. Uh, I, I had occasion, I won't use his name to embarrass him, but I had occasion to expose a very well-known Tibetan high mucky muck to uh, a DMT. And he said after, he took it like a man, said afterwards, that is the lesser lights. That is the lesser lights. 
And if any of you are students of Mahayana Buddhism, you know that the lesser lights are the lights you see at the edge of the bardo as you start into the 42-day process of dying. You encounter the lesser lights. This guy was saying to me, you cannot go further in the, in the body and have any expectation of returning. In other words, once you see the lesser lights, you have stretched the umbilicus to matter to the breaking point. If you go one step further, it's eternity for you. Well, I don't know how I feel about this. The, the head type, I've had to then ask myself, the head type, is that me? Do you actually encounter your dead soul? Is there a dimension where you are both simultaneously dead and alive, both simultaneously witness and observer? Um, I don't know, but I certainly think that if we're going to use a conservative explanation for these things, the only, con the only theory more conservative than that they are dead people is the theory that says that they are nothing whatsoever. And that just simply will not serve. I think it would come as a tremendous surprise to 20th century uh, civilization if orthogonal to all our expectations of space flight and virtual reality and all this techno schmechno stuff that we're lining up in front of us, there would be a broadside from 90 degrees out of the unexpected and it would be a doorway swinging open into the realms beyond organic existence. I resisted this fiercely, but I just don't know what we're going to do with these DMT creatures if we don't, uh, you know, try to find a rational explanation. And the any rational explanation will be exotic because the facts of the matter are exotic. Those of you who have not had this experience, who are sitting there thinking it would never happen to me, you're full of it. <laughs> it will happen to you. This, isn't, this doesn't require the willful suspension of disbelief. This doesn't require a pure heart or dietary prescription. No, this is part of the human birthright. And the fact that we deny the existence of a non-human entity, intellect, intelligence on this planet, is just part of our heritage from rationalism. And, you know, you don't have to take it very seriously, because rationalism, the philosophy that gives us permission to deny the invisible world, you know who founded the philosophy of rational materialism? Any takers? Aristotle was early. I think I'd give credit to René Descartes for modern materialism and rationalism. Well, uh, you know who told René Descartes to found rationalism and materialism? An angel. Are you ready for this? This is a suppressed, this is a suppressed history episode in the history of human thought. Here are the facts, folks. 1619, René Descartes is 21 years old. He's a young Frenchman in search of adventure. He joins a Habsburg army that is going off to Prague to lay siege to Prague to put down an alchemical revolt there. They kick butt on these alchemists, win the war, and they're on their way back to France. And in September 1619, this French army camped at Ulm in southern Germany. Some of you may know Ulm as Einstein's hometown. And in fact, that figures in our story obliquely, as you will see. This French army camps at Ulm, and uh, René Descartes hits the hay, and in the middle of the night, an angel appears to this young man in the radiance of his rooms and says, the mastery of nature is to be achieved through number and measure. 
modern science is founded, folks, right there, right then, by an angel. So how, you know, how far away are the informing voices? Uh, how, how rational is rationalism? How material is materialism? Uh, all of you must know, I'm sure, the famous story of Kekulé, the, the German chemist Kekulé, who discovered the benzene ring. He, he was uh, struggling with this problem in physical chemi chemistry, could not figure it out, fell asleep in his study, and the Ouroboric serpent appeared before him in his dream and took its tail in its mouth. And he came out of a sound sleep and said, I've got it. He walked to the blackboard. He drew the first benzene ring. Angelic intervention. Intervention uh, from the unconscious. So I, my, the point of all this is to suggest that human history is completely interpenetrated by the peculiar, the non-human, that which has intentionality and affection for mankind, for humanity. And this is what shamans call to their aid. This is how the curing is done. It's done through these spirit helpers, they're called, elementals. And um, so far as I know, Jungianism is the only modern intellectual position where you can even raise this issue without having a net dropped over you. I mean, I mean, this is absolutely forbidden by the modern world view. Uh, and yet it lies very, very close to the surface in our culture. I mean, as an example of how close to the surface it lies in our culture, consider for a moment um, Santa Claus. What's this about? Santa Claus is the master of the elves. The elves that he is master of are demon artificers. They make toys for the world's children in their vast underground toy shops. And where are these underground toy shops? At the North Pole. I don't have to tell a room full of unions that the North Pole is the Axis Mundi. Yggdrasil, the magic world ash, the center of uh, the mandala. What are the colors of Santa Claus? Red and white, the colors of Amanita muscaria. Absolutely. What is the titulary animal of Santa Claus? Reindeer. Reindeer are very central to the Amanita muscaria cult because reindeer... Uh, eat the mushroom and then excrete their urine and this is thought to be a cleaner and easier way to take the mushroom than to take it on the so-called first pass. The second pass is after the reindeer have had it. Uh, you know, just an anecdotal aside, if you're ever in the Yakut Basin, one of the great perils of the intoxicated Amanita user is to crawl out of the yurt in the middle of the night to take a leak in the snow and before you can back off the reindeer come and knock you headlong because they want to get to this Amanita flavored snow. So here is Santa Claus right in the center of our culture and when you take it apart all the motifs are there. The demon artificers, the elves, the cosmic axis, uh, the magical flight. I mean, it's a beautiful example of the preservation of pagan uh, psychedelic use into uh, a modern context.